Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for Families USA's Health Action Webinar on State Options to Rein in High Drug Prices. Before we get started, we want to share a little information with you about today's webinar. We are recording today's webinar so that we are available to make it are we able to make it available later in terms of a recording and slides for everyone who can't be with us today. If you want to make a question to us uh, during the recording and during our session today, you can type your question into the chat box. You can see that box on your screen. Just type a question anytime, and we're going to answer those questions at the end of each major section of the presentation. I'm Claire McAndrew. I'm the Director of Campaigns and Partnerships here at Families USA, and I'm going to run us through today's agenda. So today to kick us off, we're going to talk a little bit about the background on high drug prices. How do we get here where drug prices are so expensive and what does that mean for healthcare consumers? Then we're going to talk through how we can address this problem. Today we're going to talk mostly about what can be done at the state level, but we'll talk a little bit about also the options for addressing this at the federal level. Specifically for state policy, we're going to be talking through options for making drug prices more transparent how we can address the practices that we see in price gouging by manufacturers. We're going to talk about pharmacy benefit managers and how they contribute to high prices and what can be done about that. And finally, we're going to hear from our colleague, Catherine Kirk Robbins from Maryland Citizens Health Initiative about an option for doing all payer rate setting at the state level. And so today to kick it off, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Ellen Alberton. She is a senior health policy analyst here at Families USA, and she's going to walk us through the background on high drug prices. Ellen, thanks so much. Thanks, Claire. Um, so as prices for both brand and generic drugs continue to go up, it really is consumers who are acutely feeling these costs. Many people report difficulty affording the medicines that they have been prescribed, and some of these folks will actually end up not filling these prescriptions or skipping doses or cutting pills in half in an effort to make their medicines last longer. This, of course, can have a huge negative impact on people's health, um, particularly when you think about the number of drugs that people are taking as really um, for life-saving reasons. But copays and other forms of cost sharing aren't the only ways that consumers bear the cost of high-priced drugs, as drug costs are also a major driver of increasing our health insurance premiums. So addressing high prescription costs is also absolutely necessary for ensuring that all people can have access to affordable um, health, insur health insurance coverage, too. And there's a lot of support across the political spectrum for our elected officials to directly take on these high costs using tools like transparency and regulation to ensure that pharma companies aren't able to raise prices as much as they want, whenever they want, and without any accountability. And we've seen this play out with both Republican legislators throwing their support behind certain proposals and Democratic legislators supporting proposals as well. And of course, as we just saw a few weeks ago, healthcare in general is an issue that voters are paying attention to, that they're mobilizing around, and that they're basing their votes on. This concern for the high cost of drugs and support for action is playing out at both the state and the federal level. We've seen a variety of bills introduced in, I think, just about every state now in the past couple of years that get at this issue from different angles. And there have been exciting victories in states like Maryland, which we'll hear about a little bit more later, California, Nevada, and Oregon, among others. These state-level bills are an incredible opportunity to make a difference for people in those states, as well as to keep building momentum and being a positive example of what proposals we want to see enacted at the federal level. And we really do need federal action on drug pricing, in addition to all of the great work happening at, um, in the states. There are some issues like patent reform and what Medicare pays for drugs that really just can't be solved um, by individual states acting alone and that demand a federal solution. But we're really excited because we know that all of the work that folks out there are doing in the states, um, they have been leading to greater attention to this issue and more momentum at the federal level. And we've seen an enormous increase in the number of legislative proposals in Congress and proposals are getting much bolder and more members of Congress are signing on. I um, mean, we, we expect this to continue into the next Congress. But there still are a lot that states can do, whether it's increasing transparency for pharmaceutical companies or more directly addressing pricing mechanisms through price gouging and rate setting, or focusing on the role that pharmacy benefit managers, the middleman between pharma and insurers, um, also play in, the, in setting high drug prices. So now I will turn it over to Justin Mendoza, our State Partnerships Manager, to talk more about some of these options. 
Excellent. Thank you, Alan. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm excited first to talk to us about or talk to you all about drug pricing transparency, and then we'll dive into a discussion on some of the price or anti-price gouging legislation that's out there. So just to start with, um, drug pricing transparency has become kind of a hot button issue or a term that's talked about quite a bit. And I just we just wanted to start by addressing what the goal of transparency really is. Um, first of all, we really want to be able to make sure that people know um, what's behind some of these new introductory prices for medicines. New medicines are more expensive than they've ever been in the past. When a brand new drug comes to market, its um, cost is exceedingly high uh, and for some medications, diving into the ranges of hundreds of thousands of dollars per year for a patient. And then on top of that, we also have annual price increases and even sometimes quarterly price increases that really drive up healthcare costs for insurers, for individual payers, and of course for the, the public through out-of-pocket cost increases. But the hope on price transparency isn't really to directly address drug pricing, but instead to start to give policymakers, consumers, and advocates more information at their fingertips to find the right solutions that create a good balance between uh, sustaining and building new innovations as they come out and also allowing us to address high drug prices and make sure that consumers are protected from these things. So as we've seen in the past year, um, 2017, 2018 is big examples, a lot of states have actually started to pass drug pricing transparency laws, um, really starting with a bill that passed in Vermont uh, a few years ago back in 20, or 2016, rather. Um, they passed a bill that just required reporting the list prices of medicines that bear a significant impact on the state's funds. Following that, New Hampshire passed a bill um, that's pretty similar, requires um, the same kind of uh, substantial public interest and creates a list in an annual report from the Department of um, Health Services. Connecticut passed a bill last year in 2017 that actually looks at the 10 highest priced medicines. Nevada passed a bill that looks at transparency in diabetes medicines. Maine passed a bill as well that looks at a limited pool of medicines. But the two strongest state examples that have come out of the recent years on state drug pricing, uh, drug price transparency rather, are California and Oregon. So these two bills really show us the most information we think on prescription drug prices moving forward that we've seen pass so far. And on top of that are two that cover the largest number of prescription drugs possible. Um, so as you can see, even amongst these two strong bills on drug price transparency, there are a lot of different discrepancies. First of all, you can see that between California and Oregon, um, the price for medicine, uh, the price threshold that a medicine has to reach is actually quite different. A prescription in California needs to cost more than $40 for a 30-day supply for transparency um, reporting requirements to kick in, and in Oregon, that number is $100. It's a really big difference between the two. Um, we also see that the price increase percentages are different between the two, and you know there are some similarities as well, including going after and making sure that people know about the price, or know as much as we can about the prices set for specialty drugs, which are generally drugs that are $670 per month or more. Um, when we look at it as well, there's also differences in what's reported. California, importantly, has an advance notice, which we'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide, but it is an important piece to the, to the transparency bill, uh, while Oregon, because of political reasons, wasn't able to have an advance notice in their final version of the bill. And then there's differences in what's publicly reported and where the data comes from. Some of the challenges that do exist on these two bills, and I'll give the caveat of neither of these bills have resulted yet in publicly reported information. So we actually don't know the quality of the data that's going to come out of these yet. Um, the challenges are, in California, the bill is limited to only publicly available information. So things that are already introduced in tax forms and other information. And th the question remains, will that information be enough for lawmakers to act, considering right now they can access it, they just don't necessarily have it in a good package? And is it enough to help consumer advocates? On the Oregon side, there's challenges uh, related to the date of re first reporting. We'll see our first reports coming in from industry in July of 2019, which is after the next legislative session. So Oregon lawmakers need to be on, um, on watch to see if anything changes as we move into this session and then also determining what is and isn't a trade secret so it can be disclosed to the public is, of course, its own challenge. 
So within that, a few things that continue to be priorities and pieces that we've pulled out of transparency legislation by looking across the board are, um, yeah, are things that we'd like to discuss here today. First, advance notice. Um, so as I mentioned before, California requires advance notice uh, for price increases. What that means is that manufacturers have to tell payers and um, state regulators when they're going to increase the list price of a product. And in California, it's 60 days uh, before the pr product's list price goes up. However, in a Colorado legislation in 2018 that um, narrowly didn't make it through last year, um, the advance notice was 90 days in that bill. To us, advance notice is really important because for a consumer to finally see a price increase coming out of medicines that they take monthly, um, advance notice can give someone enough time to budget and plan for a price increase um, or perhaps even pursue other options to make that medicine more affordable. But as the current status quo is, oftentimes patients will go to a pharmacy counter and discover that their drug is more expensive without any advance notice uh, coming to them. So this piece in particular gives consumers more action, more um, options, and a better understanding of what's happening to their own budget. Um, the next one that's important is to understand which drug prices matter. So drug prices are kind of a nebulous term. There are a lot of different measures out there for what a drug price is. But the first one which shows up over and over again in most of the transparency bills that exist now is the wholesale acquired cost, or the WAC, um, which is really what we mean when we talk about a list price. That's the price that the wholesaler actually pays for uh, prescriptions when they purchase them from manufacturers near the beginning of the pharmaceutical supply chain. It doesn't include any discounts and rebates, but it's where we get our first look at how prescriptions are actually priced. The rebate itself is also important, understanding the discounts that are awarded to insurers and to pharmacy benefit managers, which we'll discuss in detail later. And then also the size of rebates can help attorneys general understand when there are um, practices that they actually want to pursue and take a look at um, and see if they're actually violating some antitrust laws or other areas. And then finally, the net prices, uh, which are the final negotiated prices that a prescriber or an insurer actually pays uh, for, or not a prescriber, so apologies, a payer, an insurer, state actually pays for a, an individual's prescription. That final net price um, factors into premiums just um, as its own detail there and is an, an incredibly <coughs> important piece of the information that's, uh, that's needed to understand really what affects an individual's costs at the end. So consumers often feel the, the list price, the WAC, when they're uninsured, but also through cost sharing. Some insurance um, plans and some PBM plans are sometimes, um, sometimes based the co-insurance or co-pays on the WAC. And then um, since it's not uniform, it's really important to understand the net price to get the whole picture of what really affects uh, consumers. Great. So then the other, two, the other pieces here that we wanted to bring up one of them is really understanding how folks hear about price increases. So even in the transparency bills that exist now, um, the major venue for folks to find price increases is on websites, which are, of course, mostly accessible to the public, um, but the creation of a website alone doesn't necessarily mean that people will actually get the information that's there. Um, transparency on a website alone can kind of be seen as akin to um, having a healthcare enrollment period without advertising for it. Uh, people can, who are looking for the information will find it and will benefit from it, but a lot of people will be missed. And so it's really important that we find ways to communicate price increases, even just access to the website to consumers directly. So some ideas that have been floated, and I'll note that none of these exist in any of the current transparency bills, are to um, include it in a summary of benefits. So when a consumer is getting their benefits from their insurer, they understand and see that there's a link to see drug price increases. Alternatively, prescribers or pharmacists could be required or asked to share that information when someone's prescribed a prescription or when they fill that prescription. Um, those are a few of the areas that could work, and that's something that we're interested in exploring further with state partners as we move along. And then for which drugs is reporting required? So as you noticed on California and Oregon's bills in an earlier slide, um, drug price thresholds are varying um, pretty widely on each of the bills that are coming through on transparency. And I, we wanted to raise this here because they range from you know, something as wide as the $40 per 30-day supply all the way up to just 
the 15 most costly for the state or other factors that the state can determine. And so the thresholds matter because the lower the threshold is, the more prescription drugs will be assessed, um, which will tell us the most information that we can about the pharmaceutical market. But it also means that um, insurers, providers, and um, you know, and manufacturers, as well as the state, will have more information to sift through and more to compile for public reports. So it is a delicate balance, and it's something that we want to take a look at while we look at these um, transparency bills and work at them in our own states to understand really how to reach the maximum number of consumers, but also to keep in, uh, keep in mind different factors such as the overall financial impact of a drug, the overall health impact of the drug, the size of individual price increases, and the introductory prices that exist themselves, factors that can help us determine and prioritize which drugs we need the most information about. And then finally, within that reporting requirement, we also wonder who gets what data. Um, the public might not necessarily need, you know, down to the finest detail information about the increase of a low-cost generic, or they might um, really need to know if something that is taken in high quantities is going to increase overnight. So we really want to take a look at, you know, maybe some of the data going to researchers, some of it going to departments of insurance, and some of it going to consumers directly, and really understand how that parses out while we're looking at transparency. Great. So then the next, uh, next section we want to talk about is prescription drug price gouging. So the idea behind anti-price gouging legislation or price gouging legislation is to prevent drastic price increases for prescription drugs. Um, notably, these conversations typically talk around talk about generic drugs, and we'll we'll dive into why that is in just a sec. So just as a quick history on uh, on price gouging, um, price controls were originally or were introduced on patented pharmaceuticals <coughs> in the District of Columbia a number of years ago, and that was shot down in a court case called Bio versus District of Columbia. And in that court case, it was determined that patents, or the right to a patent, um, preempts the right of a state to regulate prescription drug prices. So because of that, many states have turned to looking at generic drug prices um, as an area that could be regulated for annual price increases. And that was even further exacerbated by some large price increases that we saw a few years ago around drugs like Daraprim, which, were, um, which is a generic medicine that had its price increased by 5,000% overnight. So when we're looking at um, price gouging legislation, a lot of them do target directly generic drugs. Um, in Maryland is our main model, which of course we have Catherine on the line who's going to talk to us later about more um, up-to-date information in Maryland. But back in 2017, they actually passed an anti-price gouging bill, which grants the Attorney General authority to hold pharmaceutical corporations accountable for unconscionable price increases for generic off-patent drugs. And the idea there, it was of course limited by the bio rule to generic, but also um, it, you know, did go after those really large price increases that do exist. It was challenged in court um, based on essentially the idea that you can't regulate another state's sales from within the walls of your own state. So Maryland, essentially, um, the court's uh, reading says that Maryland is trying to regulate the price of drugs that, um, or the price of drugs and the transactions that happen around drugs in other states in order to make sure that the price is low in Maryland or kept at a certain level in Maryland. And um, the courts have had mixed rulings throughout this, but ultimately it's landed on the Fourth Circuit Appellate Court which decided that the law is unconstitutional for violating what they call the Dormant Commerce Clause. However, the Attorney General, Brian Frosch, has appealed to the Supreme Court, so we'll see where that goes. Um, other states introduced a very similar versions to this bill, but most of those have stopped because of the court decision. Yeah. Awesome. So next steps on price gouging legislation, this one's a special case. The first next step we have is to just wait and see what happens with the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court takes up Brian Frosch's case, it could change things dramatically. Um, went out in the prediction business, so we'll just have to see what happens there. Um, the other alternative to do it is to actually pass an alternative approach on this. Now, I mentioned before that you can't directly regulate patented products or patented pharmaceuticals because of that ruling in D.C. Well, uh, there is a proposal out there to actually tax the profits earned on a price increase that goes beyond inflation. It's really similar to the Medicaid drug rebate program that already exists. Currently under the rebate program, 
um, manufacturers are, have their, price, their introductory price compared to um, their current price. Well, well actually, sorry, the way, to, the way to talk about it, they do an, an inflation-adjusted price for their medicine and compare it to the current price for their medicine. So you can take a look at a drug that was introduced a few years ago, multiply the price that it was introduced at by the inflation and see where that price would be today, and then compare it to the price that they actually charge Medicaid. And when there's a difference between those two prices, Medicaid requires a rebate be paid back to the program in order to cover that difference. Essentially, it's not allowing um, a manufacturer to increase their price um, dramatically over, over the years. So if you expand that same metric out to a tax that could work across the entire state's uh, pharmaceutical purchasing system in private plans and others, you could see potentially the same kind of effect that happens with Medicaid, which is that we see instant savings and we make sure that price increases that could exist elsewhere don't affect the budgets of uh, the plans inside of a given state. Um, with careful design, you can avoid the legal pitfalls around the Dormant Commerce Clause. You could also find ways to um, you know, potentially make it uh, fit your own state's needs and understanding. So basically, an alternative approach to price gouging could be to simply put a tax on those kind of excessive profits that are made after, on year-after-year year price increases. Well, so uh, I'm going to pass this, the mic back over to Claire to talk to us about pharmacy benefit managers and what our options are there. Well, thanks, Justin. And as just a reminder, if you do have a question, you can go ahead and type it in the chat box at any time, and we will take it um, after some of our presentations. But moving on now to pharmacy benefit managers, um, as a background, I'm going to talk a little bit about what pharmacy benefit managers are. If you aren't familiar with PBMs, PBMs are designed um, to administer drug benefits on behalf of both public and private health plans. And so some of the functions they may perform include developing and maintaining a plan's formulary, contracting with pharmacies on behalf of health plans, negotiating discounts and rebates with drug manufacturers, and just simply processing and paying uh, prescription drug claims, so making sure that when we use drugs that um, those get paid for to the pharmacy on behalf of the health plan. And so while PBMs are working to drive down drug prices, they indicate that that's their goal. Many states are looking at legislation to ensure that that is actually true, that they are not actually holding on to too much money as profit uh, when they are getting those rebates from manufacturers. So that's actually the goal of um, the legislation, as you see on the slide, to make sure that PBMs aren't actually driving up prices when they're serving in that role as a middleman between a drug company and a health plan. And so moving on to the next slide, um, in addition to what we've seen at the federal level, we've seen Congress really interested in this issue. And in fact, they actually passed legislation in Congress and the President signed it. And that law is uh, called the Patient's Right to Know Drug Prices Act. And this is a law that prohibits PBMs or insurers from prohibiting a pharmacy from letting a consumer know if it's actually cheaper to pay for a drug out of your own pocket, not using your insurance, than it would be to actually use your insurance to get that drug. And so this is known as a gag clause. And so now Congress has enacted this law, but that law does not go any further. It doesn't actually require a pharmacist to tell you if it would be uh, cheaper to pay cash for a drug rather than use your insurance. And additionally, um, something that's really important to us at Families USA, that law does not say that if you do pay cash for a drug because it's cheaper than paying with your insurance, that law does not require your insurance company to count that cash payment towards your in-network deductible or towards your out-of-pocket cap. So just to illustrate this a little bit, um, basically what this is all getting at is if, say, a drug um, would cost just you know, $10 if you didn't pay your insurance at all, that's the retail price of the pharmacy, but your copayment is $20. That seems crazy, but it does, in fact, happen. And to explain the situation um, for a given consumer, if you don't take a lot of drugs over the course of the year, it might actually save you money over the course of the year to just say, look, I'm not going to use my insurance. This drug is actually cheaper without insurance. I'm just going to pay cash for that cheaper retail price. However, if you have a chronic condition, if you use a lot of drugs, if over the course of the year you keep paying cash out of pocket, over the course of the year it could end up being more expensive. And that's because you never end up hitting your deductible if it's not being applied to your deductible. You never hit your out-of-pocket cap. So you may miss the opportunity for your insurance to kick in in a more significant way and actually decrease costs for you. 
And that's why we're bringing up this opportunity that states can go beyond the federal law, and California actually did that this year. They passed a law before Congress passed theirs that not only bans the gag clause saying that, you know, you can't prohibit a pharmacy from telling someone if it's cheaper to go without in, um, insurance and pay cash for a covered drug, but that actually goes further in California and says it's required for the pharmacist to disclose the cost without insurance and with insurance. And if it's cheaper to pay for a covered drug, again, this is only drugs that are already covered on that formulary, in that case, if it's cheaper to pay cash, the insurance company has to count a cash payment for a covered drug towards an in-network deductible and towards an out-of-pocket cap. So it's the most protective solution for a consumer. In addition to all of these um, options that deal with the lowest um, cost at the point of sale for the consumer, states are also looking at other options to make sure that PBMs are doing the most they can to um, ensure that drug prices are as low as they can be. And so another thing that a lot of states have done already is require PBMs to register with a state agency. But to be clear, registration alone is not our end goal. That helps agencies know what are the PBMs that are operating in their state, but we need to do more to make sure that there are actually as a mechanism to get at prices. And so one thing that states can do is combine registration with other me mechanisms, for example, um, with transparency mechanisms. So um, when an agency requires a PBM to register, they could also require some transparency information for example, information about rebates, um, what type of rebate and how much, the value of the rebate that a PBM obtains from a manufacturer, what share of the rebate they um, retain as uh, profit or for the PBM, and what share that the uh, PBM passes down to the health plan and then the health plan is uh, passing down to the consumer. Um, states can also require price transparency from PBMs to show how the PBM actually calculates the price or determines the price of a drug, and of course that's the price that then they use to determine um, cost sharing. So that's the price they might be determining a co-insurance amount based on, or um, how much they, a consumer pays before they reach a deductible. Um, these options can also though be pursued completely outside of a registration mechanism. In some states, for example in Connecticut, PBM transparency is part of the overarching transparency legislation, the type of legislation that Justin discussed. Um, and that's really important that in addition to just manufacturer transparency, you can include PBM transparency, basically transparency across the whole supply chain. So in Connecticut, they require transparency about the amount of the rebates that PBMs are taking from manufacturers, and then from there, how the insurers are passing down that rebate to consumers to make sure that the end goal is achieved and consumers are actually benefiting, benefiting from those rebates. Finally, states can create a fiduciary duty for PBMs. And what that means is you're actually legally requiring that, fiduciary, um, that PBMs have to act in the best interest of insurers and the best interest of consumers, or by acting in the best interest of insurers, they actually are acting in the best interest of consumers, meaning they are obligated to um, be working towards the best and lowest cost for those insurers. And that can protect against PBMs taking an unfair share of rebates um, for their own purposes. But before I close on this topic of PBMs, I want to make a really important point. Although it, we are very supportive of mechanisms to hold PBMs accountable for their contribution to increase prices, there is really, really strong data showing that it is actually, first and foremost, the practices of drug manufacturers themselves that contribute most significantly to high and rising drug prices. And therefore, while we, um, you know, of course, want to do things that make sure that PBMs are doing all they can to hold down drug prices and certainly not increasing drug prices, the, um, we would recommend that the measures that Justin discussed and the measures that we're going to hear about from Catherine momentarily be the highest priorities for legislators and advocates. We certainly you know, want PBM measures to be pursued alongside of those, but we do not think they should be pursued instead of actions to rein in manufacturer prices. Um, since those are what contribute most directly to increased drug prices. So I just think it's really important to, me to uh, recommend or to make that point, particularly because you will actually hear pharma companies recommend that PBMs be addressed and not their own practices. So I just want to flag that. And so the takeaways from our section, there are a menu of options for how states can take action on prescription drug prices. And depending on the policy and political climate of your state, you can start with intensive action, 
Um, we would consider things like addressing price gouging and the rate setting mechanisms that Catherine's about to describe is um, somewhat more intense mechanisms that really get right to the heart of the matter. Um, but if more incre incremental steps seem more appropriate for your state, transparency is a great foot in the door to get the information that can lead to more intensive steps, and PBM measures also are a good way to um, get your foot in the door at the problem. But whatever you pursue, the momentum right now is really strong. We're seeing that momentum from policymakers on both sides of the aisle. Um, and we're seeing the same at the federal level, but it's a really great time to get involved in this issue if you aren't involved in it already because that um, door is really wide open politically um, to make movement on this issue. And we um, will see more opportunities for federal change in 2019, but we really think the most monumental change is more likely in 2021. So as much as can be done at the state level now, um, is the, you know, the more the better because we think that state level pressure can really be important for putting federal um, momentum, increasing that federal momentum to do more and bolder action at the federal level. Um, so with that, we do want to take a break and see if anyone has um, questions. You can enter your questions in the chat box. And then we're really looking forward to hearing a case study from how um, one state has really played a leadership role in creating momentum, trying innovative strategies. Um, so after um, we hear from some of the questions, we'll, we'll be turning things over to um, Catherine Kirk Robbins. Um, but one thing we see in our question box is a question about whether Congress or any state is thinking about requiring insurance plan formularies um, to ensure that they are not um, mid-year formulary changes. Um, and there's been a good recommendation here about you know adding new drugs might be good mid-year, but um, should things be deleted or not be deleted mid-year, and is that reasonable? And I'm happy to start and then turn it over to my colleagues and just say that um, this is something that's been certainly discussed a lot, that you know, patients um, sign up for a health plan at the beginning of the year. They, if they have a certain condition, they've checked out that formulary. They know which plans do and don't cover their drugs. And so mid-year, if you find out out of nowhere your drug has been eliminated, that can certainly pose a really significant access problem. Um, and so at families, um, you know, we certainly have understood that, and I think some of the exceptions we've understood are, you know, maybe generic comes online, or if there's been a safety issue with a drug, that might be an exception. But we have been supportive of um, measures like that with some level of reasonable exception. Um, and I believe that if you look at the NAIC Model Act around prescription drugs, there are some measures that get at that, and there also might be um, some states that have looked at that, and I want to turn it to my colleagues to see if they have anything to add. And I would just say that this is an important balance we're striking because we do want to get to measures that are decreasing costs, but at the same time, if some of those measures are too aggressive, you know, if you decide mid-year, well, now we've decided this drug is too expensive, let's take it off the formulary, um, that's going to cause a continuity of care issue for patients, and it's, it's too, it can be too unpredictable. So I think um, that's a really important balance, and that's something hopefully plans can work to, to provide more predictability for patients. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to add. Um, but I think that's a really good um, suggestion from, from the question line. Um, another great question is if PBMs aren't the main reason behind pricing increases, why are we seeing so much legislative action on this issue? We're seeing more bills targeting PBMs than rate setting and price gouging. So that's a really great question. This is Ellen. Um, you know, I think one reason for that is that um, particularly at the state level, but increasingly at the federal level too, we're seeing a lot of finger pointing between um, different players who to be really honest, all have a role here in our high drug cost, but they would all have to deflect that, that responsibility and that accountability onto other industries. So you'll see, you know, pharma would like all the attention on PBMs. PBMs are going to talk about how the insurers aren't doing enough and pharma's not doing enough. Um, but, you know, again, like Claire said, there, there are um, real abuses in the PBM system, and if that is the only way, given your kind of political context in your state or the political climate, that's kind of your best inroad into this issue with your legislators. Um, that's still worth pursuing. Um, and we've seen particularly in more conservative political states that that has been a little bit more of a viable option than some of the other um, possibilities, so definitely worth worth pursuing. But it's, it's good to keep in mind that there's a reason there's so much attention on PBMs, and that's because pharma would really, really like everyone to keep their focus there and not focus so much on the things that they're doing that are directly raising these prices. So we have a question um, that I think is for Justin. What are most states thinking about as next steps after transparency? 
and how do we make transparency have the most teeth to address drug prices? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the first thing I would point to is that you know the states where we've seen recent success on transparency are kind of reassessing, looking at what the next steps could be and should be. Um, I think that we'll have more robust plans, especially from legislators, after <laughs> the first rounds of reporting come through. Um, so we're holding on hope for Oregon and holding on hope for California to see what comes next. However, that all being said, um, to make transparency have more teeth, it's really important to pair it with some of the other measures uh, that we suggest here. We've taken a look at what the current limits are and what states can do and kind of how we can push those limits. And really on the drug price gouging setting or area and also on the all-payer rate setting area, which we'll hear more about in just a minute, um, there's a lot of flexibility in those directions to really look at how, you know, in the case where we have a transparency measure that tells us uh, that there's some kind of undue or unconscionable price increase, that we could actually take some action at the state level to bring those prices down or to maintain them where they are. Um, and so a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the kind of teeth that could exist would be based on, you know, really passing it alongside some of these other more robust measures that really do attempt to rein in or, or keep drug prices at about where they are. Um, the other piece to think about it on uh, to think about on this one is you could impose certain fines and things that also and other incentive structures that we didn't dive into as much here. You could imagine other types of tax schemes that are similar to the one in the price gouging um, proposal that we talked about earlier uh, that really go after the transparency piece. And so, as a follow-up question, um, our questioner asked if states should actually skip transparency and move more quickly to some of these more aggressive approaches. What do you think about that, Justin? Yeah, I think wherever your state has the, um, the interest and where there's legislative champions on board to move past transparency, I think it's the best approach. Uh, we, you know, we've seen success in, in Maryland, you know, they actually moved directly past drug pricing transparency uh, to go for price gouging and now for this all-payer system that we'll hear about. Um, we've also seen other states go and say that, well, transparency is not really our end-all, be-all. Let's start somewhere else. And I think that that's an incredibly important way to start it. But keeping a good, strong transparency model in your back pocket is really important as a secondary step, especially if you're in a state where maybe you have more of a, a mixed um, understanding or appreciation of drug prices as an issue altogether, or where you might have a harder political dynamic to work with. And this is Ellen. I would just add that you know, some of the transparency bills that have already passed, like in California and Oregon, you know, some of that, as that information becomes public, you can still um, use that information. So just because you don't have a transparency bill in your own state doesn't mean that all of us together as an advocate community can't benefit um, from the states who have passed transparency. So if your state's ready to, to go past that, then, you know, wholeheartedly agree with Justin. You know, use the stuff that advocates in other states have, have gotten through their transparency legislation and put that to work um, in doing something that goes more directly at, at prices. And the one last note I would actually add on to transparency, thank you, Ellen, you reminded me of this one, is that as we see what, what comes out of the state reporting um, that, you know, will kind of be shattering new ground with California and Oregon in the next year, um, we'll be able to see what gaps we still have on data. And once we see what those gaps are after Oregon decides what trade secrets count and which ones don't, and after California assesses what publicly information of, uh, publicly available information is there, we'll be able to build on that and look for what further teeth is needed and, and what further transparency can happen. Well, thank you. And I, I think that is a yes. If your state's ready to go straight into um, price gouging or rate setting, as we're about to hear about, um, more power to you. If your state um, politics aren't quite there yet, transparency can be a really great building block. Um, but with that, I want to turn things over to hear about the next mechanism, which um, is probably the most aggressive and the most exciting if states are all the way there, and that is all-payer rate setting for prescription drugs. So we're going to introduce our friend, Catherine Kirk Robbins. She is the Deputy Director at the Maryland Citizens Health Initiative. She's an incredible leader on this issue. So, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. We are excited you're here. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, first, thanks for having me. It's been really wonderful to hear from you, Claire, and Justin, and Ellen about 
everything that's going on. As Claire mentioned, I am going to talk about um, a rate setting mechanism and that approach. I am also going to talk a little bit about an advocacy framework that we use that's called the st Six Steps to Effective Advocacy. Uh, my hope is that everyone on this call can take this and use this as a tool to make effective change within their locality or their state. And it really, there's no one size fits all solution to um, prescription drug affordability issues, but this tool really can be used regardless of what approach best fits your state. So I'm going to start with the Prescription Drug Affordability Board so we can go to the next slide. So what is a Prescription Drug Affordability Board? Um, if anyone was tuned into this issue last year, they may recognize this approach as what we were calling the Drug Cost Commission. After what I can only describe as spirited responses in focus groups, we have changed the name, but the meat of the proposal is largely the same. So the board is an independent rate setting body that would look at high cost prescription drugs and set fair rates for Marylanders to pay. It would be a five member board, but it would have support of an advisory council, which would have a lot of industry and consumer representatives, and also a full time staff. Um, what the board would do is look at these drugs, and after considering a broad range of economic factors, they would set an upper payment limit that applies to the entire supply chain. And that's really important because. We don't want those savings to be gobbled up in behind closed doors. We want to make sure that that gets all the way down to the consumer. So essentially, this upper payment limit means that no one, down from the patient up to the pharmacy to insurers to PBMs, could pay more than that maximum amount. Now, the board was designed to look primarily at high-cost brand name drugs. And some of the reason we designed it that way was because when we were drafting this legislation, the anti-price gouging law was still active. But also, this is a major issue and a major price driver, these specific drugs. So we set a few thresholds that the board that would trigger an automatic review for the board. The first is any new brand name drug that enters the market at $30,000 or more per course of treatment or a year. Any existing brand name drugs that have increases of over $3,000 over a 12-month period, and any generic that has a $300 increase over that same period. And we have a sort of catch-all clause that we've put in to help protect consumers that grants the board the authority to review and set rates for any drug that causes affordability issues for the Maryland health system, including patients. So the main question I get after I give that little spiel is, what constitutes an affordability challenge? And ultimately, that's up to the discretion of the board. There's some obvious answers, like hepatitis C medications, that patients are still being triaged. They're not receiving that treatment because state health plans can't afford to pay for everyone that has it. And insulin is another one that we're seeing. But ultimately, it is up to the discretion of the board. And the second question that I get is, what a, how is this different? How will this be safe from um, violating the Dormant Commerce Clause that Justin had uh, described very, very wonderfully, I might add. And we are hopeful and confident that this would not violate the Dormant Commerce Clause, and that's for a few reasons. The first is that the concept of limiting payments is ubiquitous in state government and commercial health insurance programs. It's been in existence uh, across the nation and for a long time without any challenges to the Dormant Commerce Clause, it's, this would just be unique in that statewide payments would be set rather than individual to specific insurers or, or PBMs or manufacturers. Um, the second is that Maryland has kind of a unique system. We have an all-payer system that helps set, set hospital rate limits. That's done by the Health Services Cost Review Commission, or the HSCRC. And this would be very similar to that. So we think that we have some pretty solid footing moving forward that would establish that this is the right path for Maryland. And we can go on to the next slide. So I'm going to talk about the six steps. And before I get into the meat of that, 
I should note that this is often a multi-year process. This isn't something that you can snap your fingers and it's done. We have moved through legislation more quickly than that. Uh, we've also had long, prolonged battles <laughs> that have taken much longer than we would have hoped. But this is often a one and a half to two year process. So the first step is to create an evidence-based plan. And that really shouldn't shock most people. Unfortunately, when you're working on prescription drug affordability, on a state level, it's often a first in the nation approach. So there isn't a lot of concrete evidence that will help you solidify what you're trying to do. Of course, if you're trying to pass transparency, there's, there's support from that. But you can do a lot of things in place of that concrete evidence. And that's, you can understand the scope of the problem. We know that millions of Americans struggle to afford their medications. We know that people go without or ration or skip doses, and that leads to unnecessary medical expenditure. You can understand as much as about the solution as possible. For us, when we look at rate setting, we look at existing mechanisms within Maryland. You can look at other countries that have rate setting components. And the third thing you should really do is anticipate what the opposition is going to say. Now, what we've heard in Maryland, both when we introduced our anti-price gouging law and last year when we introduced this rate setting bill, was that this legislation, any regulation, not just this legislation, will hurt innovation. And our response to that is that drug manufacturers spend far more on advertising than they do on research and development. The second argument we hear is that it will kill jobs, that they'll move manufacturing out of Maryland. And our response to that really is that they don't close shop in countries with rate setting components. And the third is that they will no longer sell in Maryland. And I think it's really important when you're up against um, pharma advocates and lobbyists in within your state legislator, legislature to really call them out when they make that argument. Because within the same breath, they say, we're life-saving, we are innovators, we are saving people's lives. You cannot say that and also then threaten to no longer sell because of reduction in profit. And we think that there's a few reasons why they wouldn't do that anyway. There's federal mandates saying that they have to supply to 340B programs. And really, right now, they operate on a high-cost, low-utilization model. If they made drugs more affordable and more people could use them, the people that need them, they stand to make the same amount of money. But the crux of it is that even in this first step, you want to be able to pair your data with strong messaging. So it's not just that people can't afford their medications. It's that drugs don't work if people can't afford them. And that's a line that we've borrowed from Patients for Affordable Drugs, which has been really powerful and um, important. OK, next step. So the second step is to commission polling. And this is really important. You want to prove that the public will is there you will probably find that there's a lot of public support. We had 83% in favor of the creation of a drug cost review commission, which again is what we previously called the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. There is um, not much that contradicts this. This is a really popular issue and because so many people struggle with it. One thing that I would recommend is if you do commission polling, include a question that measures how voters value the issue. Essentially, you want to be able to determine if respondents would switch their party vote based on which candidate supports this issue. And in Mar Maryland, we actually found that a significant portion of voters would. The only other thing to mention with polling is if financially possible, I strongly recommend pairing it with a focus group that report can really help you fine tune your messaging and understand what motivates voters. Next slide. I think this is the most important step. It's building a coalition. So even if you have really strong evidence from the previous two, two steps, if you don't have uh, some weight behind this issue, you are not going to see it move through your legislature. So what you see on the screen is a resolution and also a logo flyer with some of our coalition partners. And essentially, we have organizations sign on to the resolution, and we take it to the legislature saying, these are all of our supporters. 
And on this logo flyer, it's mostly national, regional, or statewide organizations. But it's also really important to focus on local organizations as well. These ones that you see here are door openers. They start conversations. But when you're sitting with a legislat legislator who knows that it's an issue, but may not be completely supportive of your bill, it's really important to be able to say, you don't know that this is what needs to be done, but these 35 organizations in your district are really do, and we're happy to have them call you. Next slide. So just some specifics about how to build a coalition. Your resolution should be one page, and it should summarize both the problem and the solution. Our resolution talks about um, creating a prescription drug affordability board. It mentions including the t entire supply chain, and it talks a lot about the problem. And you want to have as broad a coalition as possible. We include faith groups, public health organizations, businesses, laborers, community groups, as many people as possible. Okay. Sorry, next slide. Okay, utilize media. You should use media to the hilt. So this is key for messaging, for controlling your narrative, and it's a really important time to use storytelling. Every single step is a great time to include stories, but um, getting those into the media is really important. And there's three kinds of media you should focus on. Earned media, which would come from press, press conferences or interviews, uh, newspaper articles. Paid media, which is digital and radio ads. Television ads too, but we've found that digital and radio are, are much more effective for us and less expensive. And you can use these at key times when there's hearings or upcoming committee votes for a specific bill. You can have these ads generate calls. Um, they're, they're a good voter education tool. And then the last is social media. And we use that to make sure all of our coalition partners and supporters are up to date on what we're doing. But it's also, again, a really important place to tell stories. And as often as possible, you want to make this issue not just about numbers, but about the real people that this hurts, because it's not an issue without consequences. Okay, next. Sorry, next slide. Next slide. Hmm. Maybe I'm frozen. Well, I'll just continue on. Um, yeah, I think I might be frozen. So the there's a few examples that people can continue to see of some media that we've used. Probably the most compelling story that I tell every chance I get is um, a story about a woman who suffered from a heart attack, and she left the hospital with a prescription for a drug that was designed to ensure she didn't have another. And she goes home, she goes to the pharmacy, and she goes to fill her prescription and realizes it's several hundred dollars for a month's supply. Now, she's a young grandmother and a sole caregiver for several of her grandkids, and she's faced with a decision that many Marylanders and Americans face and that is whether to ensure that there's food on the table at the end of the month or to fill this prescription. And she made a choice that a lot of people make. She decided to wait until the next month when she had more disposable income. Unfortunately, she's back in the hospital two days later with another heart attack, only this time she doesn't survive. And while I know there's a specific medical terminology that wound up on her death certificate, the real cause of death was unaffordable prescription drugs. And that's really important to make sure that people recognize that. Um, if you can go to the next slide, then we should be on step five. Ah, there you go. I don't know what happened to the last one. But step, step five is making your issue an election issue. And this is really, really, really important. This is how you make sure legislators are focused on this issue. And of course, this has to time with an election. Thankfully for us, it did this year. But you can you know, alter this step to fit your needs, depending on your timeline. What we do is we take our resolution and switch it to be you know, forward-facing to legislators. They can sign it. We used to call them pledges, but people tend to think that legislators don't um, 
follow through with their pledges. So now we call it a candidate resolution. And we provide this to every candidate running for state office in the two major parties. And once they sign, there's a deadline. We announce to the public who has supported this issue, and we provide them with social media toolkits and, and logos that they can use to advertise that they're supportive of prescription drug affordability. And one thing I should note is that we're, our organization is a little unique. We are 501c3, and we're also partnered with a 501c4, which allows us to do more election-based activity. So next slide. After they've signed on, it's important to educate voters. We did mailers to, in key districts to help promote um, this issue and have people learn about who was supportive. Next slide. And the next is go win in the legislature, which is uh, the best step, of course. It's important that once you've had legislators sign on and endorse your proposal that you hold them accountable when you actually get to the legislature. In theory, this should translate directly into co-sponsors or supportive votes. It's important that you kind of hold your, their feet to the fire when it comes to that. And we're hopeful this year that we will have some success with the rate setting bill. We have 113 members of our 188 member um, state legislature that have endorsed this proposal. And so we're hopeful that once we get there, we'll not only have something that passes, but something that withstands the committee and is a strong piece of legislation. So that's it. The next slide just has, I think, some information about how you can get more. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions about the six steps or specifics of the rate setting bill, and I'm happy to answer them at any time. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. Unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour, so I would urge folks with specific questions to Ka for Catherine to reach out to Catherine, or you can reach out to us at Families USA, and we would be happy to connect you with Catherine. We do want to let folks know that our Health Action Conference is coming up very soon, January 24th to 26th. And so if you have not registered yet, we would urge you to do so. We're going to have two panels related to prescription drugs, one that's going to dive in on more strategy for how you can address this issue at the state level, and one that's going to take the federal perspective and feature staff from the Hill, as well as others who are working on federal legislation on this issue. So please do register. If you haven't already, we would love to see you there. And finally, we do want to show this information. If you want to get in touch with us or with Catherine, just send an email. We know we still have some follow-up questions, so please go ahead and reach out to us if you want to talk further, or you can even tweet at us or visit our website, and we'd be happy to connect you with Catherine or any of the speakers today. Um, also, we want to just let you know that we have some capacity to work with you one-on-one -on -one in your state if you want to be pursuing legislation on this issue this session. So feel free to reach out to us and let us know if you want to work together on this issue. We've been doing a lot of convening across states of advocates who are working on this across the country. So let us know if you want to be a part of that work. You can reach out at info at familiesusa.org or feel free to contact me at cmcandrew at familiesusa.org. Thank you all for your time today, and thank you, Catherine, for all of your insights. We hope you have a great day, and please keep up the great work. Have a great day. Bye.